Nolte. Thank you for joining me on this week's episode of Fresh Look On Life TV. I'd like to begin by saying thank you to you, my viewers, for taking part in my launch day on January 13th for my book, Finding Peace in an Out of Control World. It was in part because of your support that it reached number three for the hot new releases and number 28 for stress management on the bestseller list. So once again, thank you. And if you didn't get a chance to check it out, please find it on Amazon or check it out through my website, freshlookonlife.com. You'll see a link there. I'm also excited to share with you my interview with Sandra Anderson, accomplished author and faculty from Himalayan Institute in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. I traveled to Honesdale, Pennsylvania to the Himalayan Institute to meet with Sandra Anderson. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> now, I have heard of Himalayan Institute for forever, really. Um, and I also know that people travel from all over the world to come here and to learn not only about yoga, but this is a center of spirituality. What is different about this organization that motivates people to travel far away places to find this great facility? I uh, also traveled from far away to come, <laughs> and I'm still here. <laughs> So I, I think it's not a one word answer, but I can speak from my experience and that is that what we offer here is a much broader and more comprehensive uh, view and body of practice than is easily found elsewhere. Uh, the Institute is the locus of a, uh, a living tradition and it's a very broad, uh, much more comprehensive uh, presentation of yoga theory and philosophy as well as uh, practice. Um, and even the practice is much more than what you would normally think of yoga be. So there's that that's attractive. Uh, and it's also the opportunity to live or to stay for some prolonged period of time in a setting that's outside of our normal lives. And I think it's that's an important component of really pulling back from uh, the things that normally consume our time and our thinking uh, to give yourself a, a space and an opportunity to imagine something new in your life. And we do that as well. I mean, retreat centers in general tend to do that, but we have the added benefit here at the Institute of also having a, a spiritually enlivened space in which that can happen. And location, because we were driving up, and although I've been here before in the past, you don't expect the facility yes. to be in this location. It's beautiful, and I wish I could show a picture of <laughs> yeah. uh, exactly what it was like just driving here. Yes, it's, um, it's very much in the wilderness, <laughs> so to speak, so it is somewhat of a surprise, and that also, of course, part of its uh, benefit and its virtue. Uh, and I've often felt that uh, it, it's, even though I'm living here and have been here many, many years now, I don't feel like I'm living in Wayne County, Pennsylvania, but rather in a, um, a universal place uh, that somehow has some tenuous connection with where it is physically located, but uh, I think that it has a universal appeal and an international appeal because um, of, of the energy and the space and the people uh, and the teachers that have been attracted here and have lived and worked in and uh, studied here for 30 years uh, and 40 years. And that has um, uh, made us have a much bigger reach and a much broader appeal than you would expect from um, a local or regional kind of teaching center. For sure. I mean, it is, the energy is, yeah. Amazing. You, as, as part of the faculty here, what is your role? I am a, uh, yes, part of the faculty. So I'm a teacher, a lecturer, uh, author, um, 
present workshops here as well as internationally and nationally. So I travel a lot teaching um, similar kinds of things as I teach here. I'm active in the teacher's training program. We do a lot of training of other teachers. Um, I also write um, and uh, we have a, um, a part of our mission is through yogainternational.com and that's a, uh, right now it's an online magazine, kind of thing. magazine isn't quite the right word, but <clears throat> I do a lot of contributing to yogainternational.com. Uh, prior to that, it's Yoga International magazine, I did a lot of writing, it was called this editor lunch for that. So um, that's pretty much what I do. And I, I must say, most of those great tips that you see online that you want to click on and see more about, uh, have your name at the top. Uh, <laughs> some of them. A lot of them that you're drawn to, yeah. We have a lot of, uh, Yoga International has a, a broad reach, so it's not only just the faculty of the Hamlin Institute, but uh, people that are known in the field of yoga throughout the country contribute. So. Uh, Yoga International, though, it does uh, make use of the talents and the wisdom of the Himalayan Institute also draws on a, a larger community for its content. Your, your degree was originally in geology? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Unlikely as it might seem at this point in time, yes. <laughs> How did you come about um, making the transition to yoga as your career path? Well, it, um, I have to laugh when I hear that because it wasn't a career decision. <laughs> uh, it, was, um, uh, it, it was more a, a growing desire to explore the inner dimensions of life and wanting some time to do that. That brought me here. And uh, as I stayed a little longer and kept finding some things that really felt like I was moving in the direction I wanted to go, I stayed a little longer. and. Uh, I'm still here, and suddenly I no longer have a career <laughs> in geology, anyway. <laughs> so uh, uh, it was more growing into uh, something that was uh, a little deeper and different than the interdimensional of life that I needed to explore. So it found you. It found me, although I must say, I, when you look back, you have a different perspective on how things happened uh, than you do at the time. And I sometimes feel like all of the thrashing around I did in life at an early age were, uh, were attempts to find exactly what it is that I ended up finding, finding here at the Institute and the work that I'm finding here. So even my interest in geology was uh, more a way of staying connected to the things that inspired me spiritually as a child, which uh, was the natural world. Uh, and I grew up on a cattle ranch. So um, we were fairly isolated from the uh, happenings of the rest of the world, essentially. And the biggest events of the day were the sun coming up and going down, and the uh, clouds coming in, and the rain, and the landscape, and the sky. And uh, those, um, for me, that became a, a spiritual connection. And my studies were a way of staying uh, present with that feeling. Uh, and it was that very same spiritual connection that brought me to study yoga and eventually I ended up here after realizing that what I really needed was much more available here than anywhere else that I study. So this facility or this organization, seeing you are immersed in it. You're not just yes. it's not something that you kind of study. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is very true. Uh, uh, yeah the the you live here, you work here, it's the same set of people, and we're very fortunate, uh, and this is one of the things about the Institute that sets it apart, I think, uh, is that we have a, a, a spiritual head. We have a, uh, we have not just one, but, but several um, profoundly experienced teachers who, uh, and particularly uh, Tig and I, who is a spiritual head of the Institute, uh, who embody the teaching of yoga in its deeper sense and who are able to create an environment or hold open the space where the rest of us are, are, are kind of clawing our way up the wall out of uh, the muck that we often uh, sink into. And that's one of the 
things that uh, makes being here special and also the immersion in that allows us to, to uh, accelerate our, our, our growth, I think, and that's uh, part of the attraction here for both uh, the long-term people and also uh, just anyone who comes to study for a period of time. I, I often say that as teachers, we're also students, we're always learning. Yes, and I certainly didn't come here because I wanted to be a teacher, but rather as a student. And I still see myself as that. The teaching part is uh, my uh, sharing or passing on of what I have learned, uh, which is really a necessary component for all of us in life, to share what our gifts are, right. uh, whatever those are, and according to our talents. Um, so uh, that's how I ended up in that role. But, <clears throat> Again, it was more of a desire to, to study and practice that brought me here. How long have you been studying yoga? Uh, I, you know, if you don't count all those thrashings around through early life, which in various ways, um, I started a, a more formal, recognizable practice um, uh, more than 30 years ago, 32, 3, 4 years ago, something like that. I was 28. So I was, you know, by modern standards, a lot of people start young these days, I've got to say. But when I was a kid growing up, there weren't, um, or even as a young person, yoga wasn't very... It wasn't very widespread. Well, well, right. No, so it wasn't really an option. And, um, you know, there weren't a lot of other, yeah, it was the beginning of some kind of opening up of spiritual practices at that time. I feel lucky to have been born into the time frame that I was and in the culture that I was, but I was 28 when I started practicing and, and that was um, you know, some 34 years ago or so, so yeah, it's been a while. And I, I brought your book with me because as I was doing research, I use this as my Bible and you can see my little bookmarks. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. And, <laughs> and, um, it's just so simple and it breaks down postures, but you can you can tell, describe it so much better than I can, but it just, you, know, you can pick up other yoga books, uh, but this is just what it is, it ma you're mastering the basics, yeah. and without a solid foundation, yeah. you just can't continue. And I want to thank you for this. <laughs> you're welcome. Because <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. But we have been pleased with it. My co-author, Rolf Selvig, and I uh, really kind of saw a need um, for a, a comprehensive introduction to the field of yoga. So it's not the last word on asana, but, but it has a very profound, I think, introduction to the basic uh, practices of yoga other than just asana. And there's a lot of asana in here, obviously, in the whole sequence of practice and some help for particular problem areas. But, it also gives an overview of the philosophy that's very accessible, and I have to thank my co-author Rolf Sober for that. He's very, very good at um, articulating the philosophical concepts in a way that makes you think, of course, that's exactly right for me. <laughs> and uh, so that aspect of the yoga philosophy is here, as well as practices like um, the relaxation practices and the importance of the breathing practices, which is one of the things that we are noted for here. Uh, and that we, that, that's really essential for the deeper practices of meditation uh, and even uh, beginning to uh, transform our, our worldview and our take on things. Uh, that having some mastery over insensitivity to the way the life force moves as expressed through breathing is one of the ways handle on that. So uh, the, the breath training practices are here. And, the thing that, that people sometimes miss is that yoga doesn't have to be difficult. Uh, the techniques themselves are not difficult. It's actually mastering them that's difficult. Mastering them meaning staying with them and, and, and becoming uh, so that, that, that the states of awareness and the energetic states that they engender are the norm for us. That's what's difficult. You know, I, I had an amazing teacher I shared with you that did yeah. in here, and she often says there's no competition in yoga. So in other words, yeah. don't look at the person beside you and expect yeah. to be there. You're exactly uh, at the flexibility level, at the level that you need to be. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think there's um, a tendency, especially when you start working with the body and with other people, that uh, you know it's all about whether how many poses you can master and what you what you look like the pictures and the book and etc. Um, which is has really nothing to do with it. You know, the practices of yoga and nothing. Uh, so it's fun and it's fine. It's better than a lot of other things, but it's it, it, it's not exactly you know what it's missing the point of what the practice is really about. So um, yeah, I think that that when you look at a book like this, you would never get that mistaken notion. And that's and, and that's I, part of what's nice about this book. I think, I think it does encompass just another another one of my questions that I had. There's this idea that yoga is exercise. Yeah. And yoga is so much more than that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. It's a, um, I think of it as a, a universal spiritual tradition, is what yoga is. And exercise, you know, when you, when you define it in that way, exercise doesn't actually come in the picture. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, it's a curious disconnect you know, between what most people think of it, or many people say, um, experience yoga as being. Uh, a universal spiritual tradition which also includes uh, a body of sophisticated practice that can and does nurture and heal the body as well as the mind and the soul. So we focused a lot on healing the body or working with the body, uh, and that's where the exercise acts that, that becomes. Uh, and that may be partly because it's easier to teach and experience and be comfortable with that part of it. Uh, and it's also needed. Uh, we're, you know, we're very much a kind of a sedentary society, so uh, it's a very needed component of what we do. Uh, and it also plays into our all American desire to be ever thinner and more beautiful, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> so, but we do want to not kind of get stuck in that, <laughs> trying to uh, uh, stay at that level. <laughs> uh, and I think that uh, a lot of people start out practice because <clears throat> they find it to be uh, exercise that's really accessible and makes them feel good, and uh, it is a very powerful form of exercise as well. So it's not that it isn't that, but eventually they begin to to realize that part of what they enjoy about it has to do with feeling better about themselves at other levels, the emotional and the mental levels. Uh, and they become intrigued with, uh, they become sensitive really to another dimension of themselves. And then they start roaming uh, consciously in a consciousness level. They start um, changing their diet. They start going to bed earlier. They, they stop doing some things that just lose interest in a lot of things that were, uh, things kind of drop away as, uh, there's a deeper uh, aspect of life that's helpful. Living life a little bit more with intention of a healthy lifestyle. Yes, and um, at least for me, I had no interest in a healthy lifestyle when I started yoga. That was the least of my concerns, I must say. Uh, and it was some time before I stopped the drinking and smoking and the running around. You know, that was not of interest to me, the healthy lifestyle. But it came as a result of the growth of the rest of what practice brought, the sensitivity, the, um, the feeling more alive and not wanting to somehow, not needing maybe to deaden uh, the sensitivity, be more comfortable in myself and therefore um, uh, the, the healthy lifestyle grew out of the practice. It wasn't full. Some people are more uh, on purpose to start with and realize they need a healthy lifestyle and they may use yoga to make that happen for them, but that wasn't my case. So I do think that it, it's kind of a natural outcome as a result of the physical practice. Um, but more power to everyone who realizes up front that a healthy lifestyle is desirable and worth cultivating because certainly yoga can help with that as well. <laughs> and that's one of the things the Institute emphasized. Uh, Swami Rama founded the Institute originally uh, back in the 70s um, had a big focus on the physical part of things, partly because again, it was very much needed in the culture, particularly at that time, partly because it was an acceptable entry into the other sources of practice. So um, we had a health component to what we did um, at that time, and we still do. We have a health center, and um, <clears throat> we teach an Ayurvedic uh, uh, 
information and techniques and practices, and our health center uses those um, that aspect of the yogic wisdom in its uh, application. Uh, so that's part of the yogic wisdom. So it's, it's a lot more. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, and particularly, you know, we're well set up to, to look at lifestyle because it is a, a residential kind of facility and because we have such a breadth in our faculty. I mean, Dean is also an Ayurvedic specialist here, uh, and we have a number of a chiropractor who's studied Ayurveda as well in yoga. Uh, we have a lot of um, we have breadth in the in our teaching staff that allow us to uh, to work on different aspects of lifestyle uh, as well as the philosophy and the practices. You have a number of amazing authors on your faculty. Yes, yeah, we do. Uh, and we always have uh, through the years. So we tend to attract uh, people uh, faculty-wise as well as uh, student-wise who, who have a desire to understand and uh, are able to articulate and pass on uh, the wisdom that they have uh, assimilated. And lived. I feel like the, uh, the yoga tradition is a of a broad river with a lot of currents in it. And the thing that attracted me was that it, this wasn't just one little current or one little creek or one little stream coming into the river, but rather a whole living tradition and that there were a number of currents inside of that that were um, far ahead of me in terms of their uh, understanding and evolution and that, they, that there was a way for me to find a path for myself that uh, that was going somewhere that I could understand that would satisfy me at many different levels, intellectual as well as practice wise, as well as um, devotional wise. There was, uh, there was just a breadth and a depth to the teaching um, that would allow me to, to grow um, and that I wouldn't need anything more. Anything I would get here, um, I could get everything I needed here for my whole journey. <laughs> <laughs> for somebody who might be inspired just listening to us talk about this, or might, might want to pick up your book. Yeah. Uh, is yoga good for one portion of the population? I mean, we hear excuses or, or people who may be intimidated that say, I can't do it, I'm not flexible, yeah. um, it's for athletes, it's yeah. for this, it's, it's, for that, it's for the other people. Um, who would you say yoga is good for? Well, Again, if we go back to the idea that it's a, a universal spiritual tradition, it's good for everybody who's interested. And the trick is finding the place that you're comfortable in that suits the desire and the needs you have. Uh, it's not um, it's not about flexibility. Flexibility is not required for, <laughs> for practice. But uh, it's uh, I think of flexibility as being like a byproduct, really. Even of the physical practice, it's, it's not the point of doing it, it's just that it sort of develops because eventually you need a little bit of that to, to work with your body in a certain way, especially if you have a restricted range of movement. Um, so there's that, but far more important to be flexible in your mind. And uh, uh, that you don't need to be uh, the swimsuit model kind of person in order to start working with that part of yourself. Uh, and it's more... Uh, a, a trick of finding the right situation to be studying and to be working in. So not everyone is going to be comfortable, nor should they be, in a very fast-paced, uh, rigorous, demanding, athletically uh, inclined kind of class uh, of asana. That isn't the right place for someone. It's the right place for me, actually. So uh, that's only one small component of what practice is about. And if you continue looking, you, you'll find something that will suit you, whatever your needs might be. So it's mostly a matter of, of one, defining what your interest is and what you would like to do, where you would like to start, doing some reading perhaps, um, looking around online can help. Again, yogainternational.com would be a good place to look for different styles of teaching and different information about what yoga practice is. Uh, and once you have some idea where that, what that's about, then uh, looking at your own neighborhood or your own area for be a, a yoga street group, but it could also be just a group of people that meet regularly and um, have a satsang or have a book club or, you know, that, that are, are um, <clears throat> engaging with practice at the level that is of interest to you. There's 
there are many different studies or many different teacher programs. Yes. So somebody who may not be aware of how to find the right teacher, how to find the right fit, or what to even look for. If you're not extremely flexible, is it important to find somebody who may offer um, alternatives and poses? Um, yeah, I think the rule of thumb for looking for a you know physical practice kind of class is to find one that you're comfortable with. You like the teacher, you like the people that go there, you're happy when you're there, you don't feel intimidated, you feel better when you leave than when you walked in, uh, you look forward to going, you you know, you just really feel uh, I want to be like these people and I feel like they like me. I mean just fit, it fits. So um, you just keep kind of poking around until you find them. And uh, you know, you also need to be practical in a way. You might find that place, but if it's a four-hour drive, then obviously that's uh, a special occasion. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you might find something closer to home that's not exactly your spiritual home, but it's a good class for me. It helps me to stay strong and to be getting better at what I do, and it's, you know, course for me. So um, when I, I lived out in Portland, Oregon, before I moved to the Institute, and I already had a spiritual home in connection here. I knew that. But there was a class across the street from my office, and the, te the teacher, it was a studio, the teacher there taught, amazingly, six or seven classes a day, six days a week, she was incredible. And I would take a class at lunchtime and often after work as well, and, I, and every day, because it was convenient, and because it was not at odds with my training or my interest or my practice or my um, home here at the Institute. Uh, she wasn't from the Institute or trained in the Institute way, but it was a high creditor with getting me and my physical practice over a huge hump just as a result of that regular disciplined kind of practice that she allowed as a result of going to class twice a day, which I would never have done except that it was across the street from my office. Yes. <laughs> convenient. Yes. Very convenient, exactly. And it was also one of those things, $50 a month and you had unlimited classes. Which is amazing. Isn't that amazing? Right? That, yes. that was back in the 80s, yeah. Yeah, it was amazing, and you know, she did it so that the more classes you took, the cheaper it was. So, uh, if you, you know, in an attempt to get people to practice, so you, you know, you find something that works for you, and um, definitely you want to feel better and happy about where you are when you focus otherwise. And, and it's easy to get there, otherwise, you, you know, it falls away like any other resolution. <laughs> you, you um, also write online. And yes, I've I read did, yeah. a lot of your articles online, and some of them also give tips for injuries or help for with different parts. Yeah. Can yoga be helpful for injuries? It can, uh, very definitely. But I think the thing that's most yoga is most helpful for, and this is probably the least explored or understood or applied aspect of yoga, is for um, emotional and mental injuries. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, where the real power of yoga is. Um, uh, the, the physical practices can help heal, but they're also, of course, extremely useful in, as preventive uh, measures. So it creates some strength and balance. The, the physical practices are really about um, connection, integration <clears throat> energetically, and showing up <clears throat> the energetic uh, template of the body. So. Uh, when you do that, one, injuries heal, uh, and two, there's less likely of injury again, as long as you're practicing correctly. I mean, you can also injure yourself practicing yoga if you're in the wrong class, for example, or trying to do things that are not, you know, body's not quite ready for. So uh, there's the whole body of yoga therapy that really does work with uh, the physical structure, the muscular skeletal system, and trying to heal some injuries at that level. And a lot of people come to practice because of that. But the, the beauty or the real power of the practice comes from uh, the energetic healing, which is often manifest physiologically, uh, and then the, uh, the mental emotional healing that occurs with the serious and sustained practice. So I think that area is one that is just beginning to dawn on us uh, as a culture that, that that's the real power. The, the happy side of that. Yeah. Uh, yes, although with that level of healing, you really do need to make an effort to, <laughs> to heal. It isn't accidental. <laughs> there 
are a number of individuals that um, have written into me and said they were looking at different facilities. Mm -hmm. And you see yoga programs pop up all over the place. Yeah, I'm sure do. And the more you see, the more confused they become. Mm -hmm. What do they look at? How do they find the right one? And I know they want to find the right one for them. But how do they find the one that's going to train them to be what they want to be? Well, um, I, I think again, it's, it's kind of making inquiry, uh, you know, finding out how much training and experience the teachers have or the staff has. Um, you get a feel, really, I think, by just visiting, and maybe visiting their website would be the first place, but also visiting, uh, if there's a physical location, by visiting that you get a sense of whether it's a good fit or not. Um, I do think that some sense of community or feeling of belonging uh, and some way of feeling like you have a connection with people, a community, uh, is important for getting training, whether it's as a teacher or just as a student, as a practitioner. Uh, and I, that's a little bit of a, of a um, uh, try it out. Yes. Like the start. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 and you do want to look for a breadth of experience. Someone who has been practicing for two years uh, and is now teaching um, may be fine if you already understand a lot and are not looking for the depth of whatever. Um, but you, you know, you, you do want to. Again, consider what your needs are and be kind of clear about what that is, what your goals are, what your needs are. Uh, and then you keep taking classes until you can find a place that fits. Um, if you're looking for training, for teacher's training, then you want to be perhaps more uh, discriminating about, again, clear about what you want uh, as a teacher, what your strengths are, uh, what you would like to get from your training that would how are you as a student as well as a teacher? Uh, and then look at the quality of the programs. Um, you're looking for the uh, the breadth of what's being taught, if that's what you're interested in. If it's if your goal is not merely to become a very proficient teacher of asana, then you want to look at a program that offers more on the meditation, philosophy, um, relaxation, the other aspects of practice. Um, if you wanted to be a yoga therapist working with physical problems for people, you want to look at one that emphasized anatomy or whose teachers had a lot of experience in that particular area. Um, and then I think looking at uh, the number, you know, the, the qualifications of the teachers, uh, but then also looking to see if there's some through thread there. So it's not just a bunch of uh, classes that are kind of thrown together out of left field. Uh, but rather some uh, collective uh, sense of uh, relationship between all the pieces that are in the program so that, that you feel like you have are part of um, a bigger aspect of the tradition and not just um, uh, taking a few classes here and there really belly without a consistent point of view that helps you to grow through the whole experience. And that, of course, is one of the things that we do really well here at the Institute. Because um, we do have a, a core, we have a, a spiritual um, center that um, that keeps us um, all connected, um, all of our teachers from the same perspective and speaking in the same voice in that way. And I think that's important. A strong tradition. A strong tradition is exactly what that is. Yeah, and it's not a tradition of one person who uh, you know, took a teacher training a couple years ago, but, <laughs> but again, that. I understand you're uh, preparing for a trip to India as a correspondent. Well, uh, I was at the time when we first spoke. Okay. <laughs> okay. No. No. <laughs> uh, we do have a strong presence in India. That's one of the things about uh, about the institute that that's uh, a draw for a lot of many people. And it, and though it wasn't the thing that uh, that initially really struck me, but uh, it's turned out to be a very valuable uh, aspect of my own practice and training. Uh, we have two. Uh, centers in India, two locations. One of them is at the junction, uh, the confluence of the Ganga and the Jamuna rivers, a very important spiritual pilgrimage shrine in central India, Lampa. And the other is in Kadarao. And 
Kajarama campus is relatively new. We built a beautiful shrine there and a couple of guest house. And there's been a three year long meditation going on there to kind of initiate the site. And that culminates this fall with a number of programs that are being offered by senior teachers at the Himalayan Institute. Uh, so uh, if you're looking for a trip to India, that's, that's a great opportunity. <laughs> uh, and you can find out how to get there by um, either looking at um, the uh, yoginternational.com or himalayaninstitute.org. And it's the uh, Kajaramo is the name of the, uh, the location where this uh, is all taking place. So yeah, over the years, the trips to India have been really valuable to me, and we have done a lot of traveling in India in terms of taking groups to India. And it has been a life-changing experience for almost everyone who goes, uh, in ways that they don't predict necessarily. But it's there's something about it, particularly about going to the shrines, with the intention that we do, and we go and tend to stay. It's like here we have a you know, we have a residential kind of experience in addition to traveling to see some of the sites. Taj Mahal and Benares and oh, yeah, of course. the mountains and, or whatever it might be, but to spend some time uh, in the in those uh, very those places that are just embodied with the spiritual energy. It's hard to even talk about it without sounding goofy, but <laughs> but it really it's profound. And we um, for many years took teachers there for training, and we have done that the last couple of years. But I'm hoping to start that up again at some point. Um, and I, I found almost every time, even if they didn't know much about the Institute, were not particularly uh, attuned to anything you know, sophisticated practice-wise, the experience of being there, just the experience, not necessarily anything they remembered, uh, was, was huge, life-changing and um, profound. So uh, those trips that we offer on a regular basis excursions to uh, India are really, I think, one of the powerful aspects of what we do here in the And I've been fortunate to be on a number of them. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to the next one, whenever that might be. The international connection. Yeah, it's, um, it's big. We also, as you probably know from the website, have humanitarian activities going on in Africa. Um, and we've had them in India as well. Uh, so we do, we have a whole component of what we do here that most people don't even realize and it's big and it's very potent. Our Mexico uh, Center is a big uh, uh, humanitarian activity in central Mexico uh, and then we have a, a center in Cameroon, uh, of all places. Uh, it's, uh, those are mostly educational and social uplifting kind of things that we do. Uh, but yeah, a significant number of our which is important. Yeah, it's kind of giving back to the world at large uh, and realizing that some uh, people are needing uh, physical uh, capacity of stabilization, not just mental, uh, spiritual. Uh, so, uh, and that those things are not independent of each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a big part of what we've always done. And if you look at the life of sages anywhere, saints, uh, uh, any spiritual teachers, almost always there's been somewhere, at some point in their life, they do some humanitarian thing that is either building schools or hospitals or uh, in some way or another helping people who are most in need of help. Uh, that just seems to go along with the territory. <laughs> so uh, we're proud of that part. And yeah, I was. I looked at your outreach, and it's actually something that's always drawn me to your organization because you don't forget. Because I, that's really what sets someone or an organization apart is helping someone who may not be able to do anything for you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I've enjoyed our talk, and I can't end the talk without asking you about your upcoming classes because I know that people must be wondering where you're going to be and when. Well, I'm teaching here at the uh, first weekend in February. That's the nearest uh, upcoming event here at the Himalayan Institute. Feels of Life. It's a workshop on um, the energy centers 
and by working with those in um, various ways. When you say energy centers, for somebody who is sitting at home and saying, energy what? <laughs> <laughs> they probably don't want to hear me say, oh, you know, the chakras. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, it's not that mysterious, I think. Um, if you think uh, that perhaps uh, your heart, uh, the center of your chest, is more important in some way than your little toe to your overall well-being. Uh, so our way of saying that would be that the energy center, there's a, a more profound or, or more uh, concentrated life force with important jobs at the, uh, at the, in the chest, <laughs> and that's where the lungs and the heart are operating, and those are pretty crucial. Um, not that the little toe is important, but uh, it's, a, you know, it's kind of a different level of sensitivity or concentration of the life force. So uh, the esoteric um, yoga philosophy recognizes a number of energy centers in the body, so 108 actually, of which um, usually seven are said to be the ones that we're most concerned with in yoga practice, and they're through the core of the body. Uh, and surprisingly, they're not, um, that kind of understanding is not limited, or perhaps not surprisingly, it's limited just to people alone. There are other cultures that recognize centers operating in the conscious, centers of consciousness really in the body, other than just the brain or the head, um, but will recognize um, uh, certain areas of importance, both on the physical level as well as an energetic, uh, mental, emotional level. So the Naval Center, for example, which will um, be part of what I practice of teaching in, uh, in June here, uh, doing a series on Sadhana. The Naval Center is recognized in yoga science as kind of the hub of the life force in the body. But if you look at martial arts, they move from here. If you're going to you know, kick your opponent to the teeth, you want to do it from your center. The your strong core. Your core, center of gravity, essentially, right. not from your leg, or because you end up hurting your leg <laughs> right. instead of your enemy. Uh, modern dance, which I studied for a while, you move from, uh, from here, from the center. You don't move from the periphery. I mean, the periphery is extended from the core of your being, from your center of gravity. So, there's a recognition of the importance of that center. Of course, it's also the center of your digestive system and good health and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of um, common sense kind of wisdom that come, you can bring to light using this system as an organizational template to begin to talk about it, explore it, work with it, um, figure out how to balance it and work with it in your own life and your own system. So that's coming up in, uh, in the first weekend in February. That's a really interesting class. Yeah, very, uh, um, it's one that I like. It's a, it's a nice way to give people uh, kind of an expanded perspective, but also very practical. I mean, it, it doesn't feel like it's disconnected from what you already know or what you would, you would like to be working with. So it's practical in that way and that very uh, small way. Um, and then I'm teaching in um, Pittsburgh in March and in um, Atlanta uh, in uh, March as well. Uh, we also have a teacher's training coming up in April. There's 10 days of advanced teacher's training, uh, and then another teacher's training that starts in June. June. Uh, and I have a workshop in March or in May on the breath of life, it's called. And this is working with the different prana forces, which again, this is kind of a life force of life energy. So uh, these workshops are about finding the, uh, the territory between working just in the physical body and working with the more esoteric mental aspects of yoga practice, the meditation practices, the, uh, the little more subtle parts of things, finding that territory in between that we actually have experience of that maybe don't recognize or quite, you know, has quite fully blossomed for us. And it's a good way to um, kind of expand what we understand about ourselves and the science um, building on So, a lot going on. Oh, yeah, and I'm always looking forward to all that. I also have a Sanskrit um, e course coming up next month on yoginternational.com. Uh, wow. So, for people who are wanting to look at the, uh, the language of yoga in an in a introductory way, this is um, 
not about learning the script, which is a little complicated, but rather just an overview of the language and pronunciation of the alphabet and then um, the words that are involved in yoga, so you start to get some comfort with the vocabulary. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And that's a great e-course. It's got quizzes and fun things to do and um, uh, repetitions so you actually start to come with the sounds. Which is great if they don't want to travel yet. It's a little taste for it. Yeah, and it's uh, language is hard to learn in a weekend. This <laughs> it's a good thing to do online. It's kind of it's a good, a good medium for it. You, know, you can go back and work with the go back over the content at your own rate. And, um, yes, it's my like, book. Sounds great. Yeah. I'm hoping we'll see more of you. Thank you so much for having me. You're us. welcome. Thank you, and I hope to see you all too. <laughs>